imagination connoisseurs, once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it? Especially if you love the movies. Your observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your archbishop of Banterbury, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course, the still undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am... After a long delay, Rob casting at you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the greatest community on YouTube, the post geek singularity. This is the last week I will be broadcasting from the old observatory out with the old in with the new. I am moving. We are, we are, we are leaving. Marines, we are leaving if you are alien fans, and we are moving to a new, much more effective Rob Observatory. I am telling you, it's going to be very exciting. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. Lots of stuff is going on. You know, uh, obviously, I'm on the John Campia show during the day full time. We do the John Campia show from uh, the John Campia channel. Uh, we'll see where that's going. Stay tuned. There's a lot of news dropping soon about that. Uh, you can watch the John Campia show from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. And in the afternoons, we do mailbags and we do movie club. Today, we did Man of Steel. Movie club has been doing well. It has its own podcast feed, as does this show. So that's very exciting. Of course, Moon Knight, my God. Moon Knight. I, I, I want to see Moon Knight for over 40 years on the big screen, small screen, wherever. And in a mere, it's 9 right now, it's 9.18 Pacific time on Tuesday, March 29th. I mean, at midnight, it goes live. I can't believe it. I'm going to go walk the dogs and I'm going to go watch Moon Knight. I, 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 I'm beside myself with excitement. So that's very exciting. And as many of you know, I'm a Star Trek fan. No, it's totally true. I know some of you are like, Sh I'm shocked, Rob. I'm I'm shocked. You're a Star Trek fan? Yes, I know. I, I won't belabor the point. It's an old joke. Now, as you all know, there's lots of Star Trek being produced now. There's Star Trek Discovery. There's Star Trek Picard. There's the upcoming Star Trek Strange New Worlds. There's going to be at least two seasons of that. There's Star Trek Prodigy. There is Star Trek Lower Decks. Who cares? I mean, really. Star Trek Picard has turned into a greatest hits collection. They keep adding. They keep like, like, like in the latest episode of Star Trek Picard, there are TOS references. I mean, all the way it, it, to the point where there's so many references in one episode of, of Star Trek that references other Star Trek. Uh, I'll tell, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So you've seen Dave Parker on this channel. And, of course, I produced and Dave Parker directed a horror film that came out in 2009 called The Hills Run Red. During the pandemic, we worked on the Shout Factory or the Scream Factory Blu-ray, the first Blu-ray release of The Hills Run Red that came out in 2020. And it was nominated for a Rondo Award for Best Special Features because it was like Dave and I created like eight hours of special features. But in that movie, in The Hills Run Red, 
the characters are huge horror movie fans. And there was a decision, the original script that we got, there, there was just reference after reference after reference to real horror movies. And the decision was made, Dave and I talked about it, and Dave Scow, the screenwriter, talked about it. And so these guys are steeped in horror films. <laughs> and what was interesting about it was, okay, well, we could go and we could have gone and got all this paraphernalia from other horror films. We could have got one sheets for Evil Dead or Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween or Texas Chainsaw Massacre and peppered the sets with all that. But the problem is then the audience would be constantly reminded of, of other horror movies or perhaps better horror movies or horror movies they might, not, they might even want to be watching more than our movie that we were making. So the decision was made to create our own movies. And there was a great guy named Stephen Romano who had done a basically a coffee table book of fake movie posters. They looked real, but they were like exploitation movie posters. And so we went to Stephen Romano. We asked him, we said, hey, man, can we use your uh, fake movie posters, your own original art in our movie? So in universe, there was all these movies they were fans of that the audience didn't know about. So when you saw the posters on the wall, you know, they're, it's just a small part of the film, but there was nothing that people would be, oh, I remember Nightmare on Elm Street. Everything in the movie, everything in universe in the movie was new. Well, in, in the last episode of Star Trek Picard, there were so many references to classic Star Trek, other Star Trek, that I, I and all of it was, was like all, like, <laughs> oh, Star Trek Picard is now taking place in France and in Los Angeles. And of course, in Los Angeles, wherever our characters are, every place they go is a reference to a classic Star Trek episode, which is the dumbest shit in the world. I just I just want to say, like, I don't care if I'm meeting a character who's reading a book by Tracy Torme, who wrote episodes like the TNG episode, The Royale, while she's sitting in Jackson Roy Kirk Plaza. Of course, Jackson Roy Kirk created... The Nomad probe that uh, that collided with another alien probe to create the Nomad probe we saw in the second season Star Trek, the original series episode, The Changeling. There's references to Assignment Earth, which is the last episode of the second season of the original series. That it, it, it was in itself a backdoor pilot. I mean, these references are, are absurd. It, and it completely shatters. If you're a Star Trek fan, I know they're, we're supposed to say, I don't know what. Is this clever? You know, the 21st Street Mission, that was, of course, from City on the Edge of Forever. That was in New York, but now it's apparently a UNICEF-like organization that's also now in Los Angeles. And then, of course, of course, Kirk Thatcher comes back to play the exact same punk rocker he was playing in 1986's Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Apparently, 38 years in-universe, he's still a punk rocker, and he's still playing with a boombox in... 2024. Now, am I supposed to like this? No, this is all this is all stupid. It's it's just it's all it, it's it's not clever, it's not funny, it doesn't work story-wise and it completely shatters any verisimilitude, especially for Star Trek fans. But this is par for the course for modern Star Trek. A modern uh, Star Trek Picard isn't even about Jean-Luc Picard anymore. It's he's just along for the ride whatever is going on with Q. He doesn't have his powers anymore. He's dying. Really, I don't care. <laughs> I'll watch it, but I don't care. Um, it's it's Star Trek's greatest hits. It's just take a bunch of Star Trek stuff. Literally, take your story points, take your plot points, take your references, take your art direction, put it into a blender and hit a button and just throw it out, and I'm supposed to... Look, man, you know what Star Trek should be? Great stories well told. I belabored the point a million times. We are not getting that. We're getting elements of stories that other writers and creators and showrunners created themselves, and they're being they're literally being cherry picked by the modern creator of Star Trek and thrown into a blender. It is the most unoriginal, uninspired, it's just depressing because there's no effort made to create something new that's actually I would think if I was creating a show and I got to play in a sandbox. I would want to, as they did 
for 18 years under the Roddenberry Berman era of Star Trek create new things for the most part. There was not very many references to classic or previous Star Trek in the next generation. There just weren't because they were forging their own path. The premise of their show, you know, like Deep Space Nine, we'd never seen a Star Trek show set on a space station. I mean, now there's so many references to so many different Star Trek episodes in, in I, I, I've lost count. I'm like, what? And what I don't know is what story are they telling? Like, they, they haven't quite figured out anything. Their, their, their time travel mechanics don't make sense. It's, it's depressing. But you all already know that. And, you know, it's par for the course to hear it from me. So I don't need to belabor the point. What I did want to talk about, though, what I did want to talk about is something I think is very exciting. And as you know, that is this. The Star Trek, the motion picture director's edition that is coming out on April 5th on Paramount+. Plus. Now, you might ask yourself, all right, what's the big deal about this? Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. Most people might not know this, but a lot of you Star Trek fans will. Of course, on December 7th, 1979, Star Trek, the motion picture came out. It came out uh, 10 years after the original Star Trek series went off the air. And it was in the wake of Star Wars after fits and starts. There was a movie that Philip Kaufman was going to direct called Star Trek Planet of the Titans that Tashir Mifune was going to play a Klingon in. Well, that didn't happen. Although uh, Discovery, Star Trek Discovery, the design of Star Trek Discovery actually comes from that aborted uh, Star Trek film. Uh, Ken Adam and Ralph McQuarrie, yes, that Ralph McQuarrie, had designed a, a version of the Enterprise. They'd even made study models of it that Brian Fuller went back to when he originally conceived and created Star Trek Discovery before it was, well, <laughs> sort of appropriated by Secret Hideout and Alex Kurtzman. So now they've co-created it. But it was it was Brian Fuller's idea to use that design from Planet of the Titans that was unused for Star Trek Discovery. But anyway, that never happened. And then in the wake of Star Wars, they were going to make a new Star Trek Phase 2 television series. And if you're interested in where that was going, there's a fantastic book written by Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens, uh, Star Trek The Lost Series. It's all about the Phase 2 series. And there were 13 uh, stories and scripts commissioned for that series, and two of them were actually made for The Next Generation. The second season opener, The Child, was uh, utilized. That was an original script that was uh, written for the Star Trek Phase Two series that was repurposed for TNG because there was a writer's strike going on. And in the fourth season, they uh, used Devil's Due, a script that was originally written for the Star Trek Phase Two television series. And they didn't... Um, they owned it, so they just repurposed those series, those 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 the, that series scripts, and used them. So they had built sets. They were doing costume tests, and they decided to scrap the entire Star Trek Phase Two series and make a movie. So the movie that they were making turned out to be Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and there was uh, it was there was a, I won't get into the whole production of it, but we're going to be giving away one of the greatest making of books about any movie called Return to Tomorrow that's all about the making of Star Trek the motion picture that was actually originally written and commissioned to be written for the late lamented Cinefantastic magazine. And it was going to be a two-part, or uh, it was going to be a double issue, a double issue of Cinefantastic. And it was later, thanks to Lucas Kendall and Taylor White, published as a book, which we are going to be giving away copies of in the next couple weeks here on the channel. And we are going to be talking about the return, kind of the way Fangoria returned. Cinefantastique is going to return. One of the great magazines of, uh, of science fiction, fantasy, and horror films and media. And it's coming back in a big, big way. Digest size, heavy gauge paper. Each issue is going to be like a book. It's not like a magazine anymore. It's going to be a quarterly publication. And you're not going to have to wait for it. They're going to do a crowdfunding campaign. And the issues are already completed. Well, at least the first issue is totally completed. 
and uh, the Kickstarter is going to kick off. I don't want to I don't want to seal anyone's thunder, but that information is forthcoming. So that's very exciting. But anyway, so Star Trek the Motion Picture was made, and it was fraught with peril when they were making it. It was. Uh, they had they were locked into the December seventh, nineteen seventy nine release date, and what ended up happening is the first effects company wasn't able to get anything done, so they had to replace them famously with John Dykstra and Doug Trumbull, the effects maestro who did worked on two thousand one, directed Silent Running, worked on Close Encounters, and of course did the effects for Blade Runner. He came on and worked on Star Trek: The Motion Picture along with Doug Trumbull, and they were fighting their release date. So Star Trek The Motion Picture was never refined. It was never, uh, it, they, they, they just didn't have enough time to ever finish the movie properly. And the movie that you saw in theaters, it was very sloppy, uh, technically sloppy on a number of different levels. And they never had time to really refine it in the editing room the way director Robert Wise wanted to do. So the movie that came out was not satisfying from a storytelling standpoint, to most people. However, it was a big success, and the fact that they brought the TV actors from essentially a failed television series, it only ran three seasons, and they put them in, at the time, the most expensive movie ever made. Now, which is a misnomer, you'll hear numbers quoted that Star Trek The Motion Picture cost $44 million to make, but what they had done is they rolled in the costs of all the development throughout the 70s for these various Star Trek movies into the budget of the film, because they had to recoup it. So when Star Trek The Motion Picture came out on December 7th, 1979, it was an unfinished work. And over the years, there was an ABC television cut that had different scenes in it, more scenes. It was expanded. There was home video versions of it. And there was there was various iterations of Star Trek The Motion Picture, some of which were good, some of which were not as good. There was even famously a spacewalk scene where you could see Kirk coming out of the primary hull of the Enterprise, the saucer section, you could see the scaffolding and the soundstage. That was actually in the a cut of the film. So back in 2000, Robert Wise, of course, who directed Star Trek The Motion Picture, directed The Sound of Music, co-directed West Side Story, directed Day the Earth Stood Still, directed The Andromeda Strain, edited Citizen Kane, directed Curse of the Cat People, directed The Sand Pebbles, a very esteemed director, went back uh, with a team of people. Uh, Mike Matsino. Uh, who he had been previously working with for five years, Mike and Robert Wise had a relationship and they had worked on on various things together. And the idea, I'm sure they'll talk about it in an interview. I don't quite, I don't want to speak for them, but so Mike uh, hooked up with producer David Fine, who had worked on some uh, other special feature features. And then of course, my good friend, Darren Docterman, who, he started his career working on movies like The Abyss for James Cameron, and he worked on Exorcist Three. Um, and he he'd been working in films. He's a, a tremendous production illustrator and prop designer, and uh, amazing. He's an amazing artist. So the three of them teamed up to work with director Robert Wise on refining Star Trek: The Motion Picture. And at the time, DVD was huge. This was at the very beginning of the two thousands. And they, I think they started, I went and saw, I went to the Director's Guild, I was there watching a version of Star Trek The Motion Picture, the theatrical release with a bunch of my industry friends, including the Akutas and Darren Docterman himself, and we all were at the Director's Guild with Robert Wise, watching Star Trek The Motion Picture in 2000, and it kicked off a uh, restoration of the film for what was called the Director's Edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture. So the uh, Mike and Darren and Dave Fine went in and they uh, used storyboards and uh, they consulted with Robert Wise and took the various iterations of the film that had existed and created what in Robert Wise's mind would be the definitive edition, his director's edition of the film. And it was released on DVD in 2001, so 21 years ago. The problem was... And it's, I think, in my mind, aside from a few really, I think, quite objectionable uh, changes they made to the movie that I disagree with vehemently, but that's okay. No one asked me. Um, uh, I, that anyway. So they, they, they. It was only finished in standard def, four eighty by six forty by four eighty, uh, old TV standard. You know, um, it, it actually wasn't. It was, it was, uh, yeah, six forty by four eighty. 
uh, like TV, it wasn't in HD. So for 21 years, when we moved into an HD world, Star Trek The Motion Picture, that director's edition, only existed in standard def. And we now live in the 4K world. So the standard def version of Star Trek The Motion Picture, well, it might have been relegated to the scrap heap of history. And there had been attempts over the years to try and get uh, Paramount and CBS to pony up the cash to allow them to make a definitive director's edition in high def. And as many of you know, I worked on the Star Trek The Next Generation Restoration Project. I worked on that project with Roger Lay Jr. for three years, creating all the special features, over 50 hours of documentary material, where we talked to most of the principal cast and crew for hours and hours and hours, and created documentaries for that release. So if you're a physical media fan or you like Star Trek The Next Generation, get those Blu-rays, get the box set, get the individual two-part episode discs that were cut into movies. There's five of those. Get those and you can see all of our special features. But anyway, um, so Star Trek The Motion Picture, back in July, they announced, back in July of 2021, they announced that they finally, for Paramount+, Plus just the way the Snyder Cut had HBO Max come in, and now HBO Max could pay for the Snyder Cut to get finished. Uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, the director's edition, thanks to Paramount Plus, has been finished. Now, what's really interesting, so let me read this uh, article first about the director's edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Eagerly anticipated by Star Trek fans for over two decades, Star Trek The Motion Picture, the director's edition, will make its long-awaited debut exclusively on Paramount Plus on April 5th, 2022, in celebration of First Contact Day. That's, of course, from the movie First Contact, the next generation film. The film will be available to stream on Paramount Plus in 4K Ultra HD on supported devices and platforms. The newly restored film will subsequently arrive on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray in September from Paramount Home Entertainment. In addition, fans will have the opportunity to see the restored version of Star Trek The Motion Picture, the director's edition, on the big screen. For the first time, when Fathom Events and Paramount Pictures bring it to theaters for an exclusive two-day event on May 22nd and May 25th. Tickets will go on sale Friday, April 8th at FathomEvents.com, although I've heard that some theaters are selling tickets already. Originally released in 1979, Star Trek The Motion Picture became the fourth highest grossing movie of the year and earned three Academy Award nominations for visual effects, best art direction, best music, original score. The film successfully launched the Star Trek franchise beyond the original television series, despite having been rushed to theaters with incomplete special effects and forced editing choices. In 2001, director Robert Wise revisited the film to refine the edit and enhance the visual effects. His updated vision was released on DVD in standard definition and embraced by fans, but has never been available in higher definition until now. Meticulously assembled and restored by preservationist Mike Medicino, visual effects supervisor Darren Dockerman, and producer Dave Fine, uh, they both all they all worked originally with Do- uh, Robert Wise. The film has been prepared for presentation in 4K Ultra HD with Dolby Vision, high dynamic range, and a new powerful and immersive Dolby Atmos soundtrack. Uh, Matticino and Darren Docterman and Dave Fine assembled a team of special effects exper- experts and utilized the extensive resources in the Paramount archives to create the effects not just in HD, but in Ultra HD. After more than six months of painstaking work, the updated movie looks and sounds better than ever while staying true to Wise's original intention. Now, this is one of the great things about the modern age that we live in. We're allowed to see these kinds of restorations take place. To me, and I'll say this, Star Trek The Motion Picture is my favorite of the Star Trek feature films. Is it flawed? Certainly. But it is the most Roddenberry and it is the most Star Trek of all the Star Trek feature films. I think probably the best movie is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. But Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan owes more to the actual Horatio Hornblower novels than I think it really does to Star Trek itself. Although it is a great movie and it is a sequel to an original series episode, Space Seed, without having... I mean, it's amazing to me because... Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, the whole movie is a reference to another Star Trek episode, but it feels fresh and new, and the references never bog down the story, unlike 
episode four of Star Trek Picard, whose willy-nilly references made me want to punch the screen and scoop my eyeballs out with uh, tablespoons. So anyway, because they were just ridiculous. I mean, it was like, you know what, it was, there, there's a character that uh, Michael Sheen plays in uh, Midnight in Paris, the Woody Allen movie, Midnight in Paris, and he just wa- walks around and pontificates on everything, and you realize he doesn't know half as much as he thinks he does, and he just throws shit out there. I feel that's what the producers of Star Trek are doing with Star Trek Picard. Let's just throw a bunch of shit out there, and I'm like, bro, where's the story that you're telling me? I don't know what it is. What what? Where's Jean-Luc Picard's story? Like the, in the first season, Jean-Luc Picard is not really uh, in his own movie. So uh, I'm, I just got a uh, Chris Gore has sent me a message. Film Threats, Chris Gore. Um, he's asked me if I'm going. Uh, uh, yes, Chris, if you're watching this. Yes, I did. Uh, I did. I don't. <laughs> I'm scared that if they <laughs> know that I have an invitation, I'll get disinvited. Um, <laughs> but yes, so the, the, the premiere of this is actually on the Paramount lot. Uh, f- Monday night, April 4th. So that's pretty uh, exciting. Mm. But anyway, so I wanted to read a little bit about, uh, this is an, uh, an interview with Dave Fine uh, about this that I found really interesting because there's things in this article that I did not know. I know. There's things about Star Trek I didn't know. Shocking. So this was on Star StarTrek.com, uh, and this is an inter- interview with Dave Fine. Uh, 1979, blah, 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 I already told you all that. Um, I grew up in the classic TV show, Dave Fine told Star Trek.com during an interview. I was living in New York City, and I had to be home at 6 p.m. every single night in order to see Star Trek. That was just like me. I grew up on classic Trek. It became a major part of who I am. I learned so much about it, watching that and growing up to learn everything I possibly could about it. He continued, what was always important is that the story mattered first. Fine first joined the franchise 22 years ago when he, along with director Robert Wise and Mike Mendocino and Darren Dockerman released the director's cut of Star Trek The Motion Picture. The film had never been finished originally. It was rushed into theaters because of various marketing arrangements that had been made and promises of the movie opening when it needed to open. Whatever could be assembled was assembled and put into the theaters. That was so rushed. There were so many problems with the film and even the print, uh, even the point of the film was missing. Now, I will editorialize here. One of, one of the things that I love about Star Trek The Motion Picture is... Unlike, say, Star Trek Discovery, which just decided to saddle Spock with a learning disability, which is the dumbest shit ever, uh, modern Star Trek completely misunderstands the character of Spock. I, I, I find it flabbergasting that they do, but they do, but whatever. One of the great things about Star Trek The Motion Picture that the theatrical edition didn't have that we saw with the ABC TV version and the home video version that was released is... Star Trek The Motion Picture has a deep, fundamental change and growth of the character of Spock. Of course, the character of Spock is a man of two worlds. He has a human mother and a Vulcan father. And unfortunately, uh, when he was growing up on Vulcan, on one hand, he he, he loved his mother, obviously, but, but he was never at home on Vulcan, and um, he, he was a man of two worlds. So... He had to overcompensate. He had to be the best Vulcan. And, of course, he had a great rift with his father, uh, Sarek, who wanted him to go to the Vulcan Science Academy, but he didn't want to do that. He had a wanderlust, probably instilled in him by his human mother. And so he wanted to join Starfleet, and he wanted to explore the universe. And the whole thing was he was a man from two worlds but not part of them. And it was on the Enterprise with Kirk. He served under Captain Pike for 11 years on the Enterprise. But then when Kirk took over, I think, according to the show at least, was when he found his true family. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, the triumvirate, the id, the ego, the superego. That's what made the Star Trek TV series so um, an amazing, an amazing series. Uh, but the character of Spock in Star Trek The Motion Picture he has gone back to Vulcan, and he is studying the Kolinar discipline, where he wants to get rid of. Here, here's here's a here's here's a, a very a lot of people do not understand this. Vulcans are emotional; they have emotions. 
just like anyone else. As a matter of fact, they used to be overly passionate. They were probably the most passionate people in the universe. But when Surak, the philosopher Surak, uh, came uh, into their civilization, he brought them a, a philosophy, uh, the philosophy of, of logic and controlling your emotions. So Vulcans that are touch telepaths, they used the teachings of Surak and they became the species that was able to govern their emotions, control their emotions. That's what Vulcans do. They have the utmost control, kind of the way monks do, Shaolin monks or whatever, various religious orders. So they believe in logic and, and science, but they control their emotions. They have them, but they control them. And the thing about Spock was, even though he had a human half and he had a human mother and he came from half, half of his being was from a very emotional state, he had to be better than most Vulcans, so he, he, he knew how to control his emotions better than any Vulcan, but at the same time, he could still work in the human realm. That's why he was such a great first officer to Kirk on the Enterprise. But in Star Trek The Motion Picture, uh, our crew, one of the things I love about it, they're not together anymore. Kirk is now Admiral Kirk, and he basically is a bureaucrat. McCoy has gone on to study Fabrini medicine. Now, here's the funny thing. Here's, here's what's so great. Like in Star Trek, the motion picture, uh, they don't even tell you. This comes from the novelization. But the Fabrini was the group of people that lived on the asteroid Yonata in the third season Star Trek episode, For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. Well, in Star Trek, the motion picture, only the novelization tells you where. And it was written by Gene Roddenberry. He got paid $400,000 to write that novelization much to the chagrin of um, uh, Mr. Livingston, who wrote the screenplay with him. But um, that's another story. Uh, the, so so uh, McCoy had been studying for Brini Medicine with Natira, probably the love of his life, I guess. Uh, they don't get into that really in the movie, but it was there. Spock had gone to Vulcan to study the Kolinar, discipline with Vulcan, the Vulcan masters, which would purge any remaining emotion in him. If the teachings of Surak were not enough, you could undergo the Kolinar ritual and learn to really control your emotions. And Spock was doing that. He'd been doing it for years. And yet he felt a strange consciousness calling him from outer space and it stirred his human half. And it didn't allow him to achieve Kolinar. It, it, it stirred a yearning. He felt emotion because of whatever consciousness he was feeling from space. So he failed. And one of the great things about Star Trek The Motion Picture is Spock fails in the beginning. He, he has literally has his back. The Vulcan masters turn their backs on him. And when you saw the movie for the first time, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, Spock, he didn't just fail. He failed with his own people. And so over the course of Star Trek, the motion picture and, and what happens if you haven't seen it, wait, watch this new director's edition of the film, because it is a wonderful movie. It is a true science fiction film, and it is more in the spirit of the original series and the conception of what Star Trek is than any Star Trek that came after, with the possible exception of maybe Next Generation in certain episodes. It's a wonderful movie. Spock undergoes a profound change in his character. And what he realizes over the course of Star Trek The Motion Picture is more profound than anything they ever did in Star Trek Discovery and Strange New Worlds by saddling Spock with a learning disability, which is a fundamental lack uh, of understanding of the character. But, hey, I understand you have to make the audience see themselves in every character you write now. Hey, Spock's me. I have a learning disability, too. <laughs> Anyway, that's just me. Um, so, anyway, uh, one of the great things that Dave Fine talks about this, um, uh, and this is what I thought was really interesting. He goes on, and, and uh, I, this article is on Star Trek.com, but what's really interesting is here's what they talk about. Here's what Dave Fine talks about with this new 4K restoration. 
Then we upgraded it again because now we're going from a postage stamp to a theater screen to a giant screen, Dave Fine said, and everything had to hold up. So the first thing we had to do was build the team back, and then we had to start working on the effects. Because when you're doing effects, the standard definition effects up to 4K is like 12 times more than in terms of resolution, 12 times more, 12 times bigger. But at the same time, we had to go back to the studio and get the scan of the film, the negative of the film. Another challenge was working on the sound, which led to a fantastic discovery for Fine and his team. They discovered the original ADR, which is automatic dialogue replacement for the film, that they had previously not had access to, which meant a piece of Star Trek history was being unearthed as they remastered the film. This also led to a heartfelt moment for Fine. Bob was directing the actors, Fine said, getting emotional as he spoke about his friend who passed away in 2005, to hear him saying, okay, now let's do it again, but this way was magic. There have been just a few times that I felt like he was standing behind me or telling me, we need to do this, we need to do that. It was so precious that I just had to love it, and that was one of the many things. For fans of the film, Dave Fine has another big surprise he revealed during the interview. There's a deleted scene that we wanted to have back 20 years ago. So this is a scene that has never, ever been seen by Star Trek fans. He said, this was Ilea and Scotty and Decker in engineering. We found some of the footage 20 years ago, but there was no audio. So there was really no point in showing the scene. But it's three or four scenes that people have wanted to see forever. So we retransferred that footage. And then we found out that Bob looped the dialogue for the scene, which means he has the actors come in because it was noisy on set, and then they go into a booth, and they loop the scene, meaning they talk over where they're supposed to be saying their words, and that they do that on movies all the time, but they didn't have access to that 21 years ago. So they're going to put that in the physical media release, so there's deleted material no one has ever seen that's going to be on the physical media release of this disc, which is dope. Fine also tease, there's new dialogue from the actors in the background here and there that you've you've never heard before that you're going to be surprised about. Classic Star Trek didn't have the money for visual effects, Fine later said as we discussed the original series. Flash to Star Trek the motion picture and there's so much spectacle, but it always maintained, remained about the people and that's what's precious. One of the things that I've always said about the director's edition from when we originally cut it to even now is that we found our captain, he said. When you watch the original theatrical edition, Kirk is really angry. I never felt that he was really the character of Kirk that he was supposed to be. Even Bob didn't feel it was right, but it was what we had to do to get the story together. So through editing, we were able to make him more human and more Kirk-like. If you pay attention to the story as it flows now, where I say it's compelling, I love how he's alone, he gets the Enterprise back, but he's not feeling overly secure. McCoy comes, he calls McCoy back, and he gets a little more confident, fine at it, and then Spock shows up, and you see the joy in his face, like I never thought Spock would be here. Imagine just the thrill and the fact that he boldly went where no movie or series went before, and it launched everything. So it's a gift to fans. Dave Fine has also created phone backgrounds and desktop wallpapers, featuring the remastered version of Star Trek The Motion Picture, the Director's Edition, and you can download them here. This is at the end of this article, so I'm going to link to that in the... uh, I'll put that in the uh, chat here um, so you can see that. Or uh, I was going to, but I can't. Hang on, because I don't have the screen up. But um, if you go to the StarTrek.com article with the interview with Dave Fine, you can find that. So that's very exciting. Um, Look, for me, uh, there's a reason why Kirk doesn't feel like Kirk at the beginning of the movie. And they did cut things to soften that because as it was explained to me is that he doesn't feel so much like Kirk. Yeah, because he hasn't been Kirk. He hasn't been himself for two and a half years. He is angry. And the change was there, but you didn't need to soften him. He could be harder at the beginning. I'll tell you, that's uh, there's, a, there's, there's a section in the film where V'ger, the crew, Kirk is showing the crew of the Enterprise, the new Enterprise that's about to be launched, what they're facing. And I, the one thing I really objected to that they cut out of the, this, the director's edition, I think it's the biggest mistake, is Kirk is showing everybody what's happening. And while they're doing this, the Epsilon 9 station, the Federation relay station, Epsilon 9, is destroyed in, live. They watch a Federation station destroyed by V'ger. And um, people are stunned into silence. And Kirk says to Uhura, you are off. And she's so stunned that she doesn't respond right away. And he says, view her off again and then she responds and the 
conventional wisdom with the guys working on the director's edition is that Kirk shouldn't have to repeat an order twice. And I would say, well, one, the fact that he has to repeat it twice shows his state of mind because he's annoyed. You know, he's frustrated. He's not the Kirk that we know. And that shows us it's not the Kirk that we know. And then, of course, Uhura doesn't respond right away. And she has to be told twice. And that shows how, how grave the situation is. I think it was always a great moment. It was my favorite, not my favorite moment in the film, but one of them. You know, and they changed it back in 2001. I said they should change it back. But, you know, they said Bob Wise wanted it that way. Mm, okay. But uh, I don't think it's better. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm very excited about this. I'm very excited about because this is Star Trek that Gene Roddenberry oversaw. It's pure, uncut Roddenberry. It's something that has been missing from Star Trek since 2009, even the Berman era of Star Trek. Rick Berman worked with Gene Roddenberry to create TNG, and the DNA of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek went through Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and all the way to Enterprise. Since 2009, all of the people that have controlled the Star Trek franchise have wanted to make it their own. So they have pilloried uh, original stuff that they didn't like. They have... They have taken things that they did like and tried to make it their own. Star Trek Strange New Worlds, an opportunity to give us characters like Dr. Piper that we met in the cage that, oh, apparently is not on the ship, which is too bad. So let's go back and take all these secondary characters like Christine Chapel, Dr. Mbenga, Uhura, and uh, apparently a relative of Khan, Nooney, and Singh. So you don't even get you don't even get a crew of new original characters anymore. Everything is a throwback. Strange New Worlds is... Star Trek 09 was revisiting the original crew. Discovery is a prequel to the original series. Strange New Worlds is an original prequel, a prequel to the original series. Where's the originality here? You know, everything Prodigy has to have Janeway. I don't know, man. Uh, but anyway, it's very exciting to see Star Trek motion picture come about. We're going to be able to see this new version on Paramount Plus next Tuesday, a week from today. Can't believe it. It's amazing. Um, it means a lot to me. I was 12 years old when Star Trek The Motion Picture came out. It was a big deal for me. I, I, I was at the theater. I saw the first show at the John Dance Theater, which not, is not there in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a big deal. A big deal at the time for any Star Trek fans. No one will understand it. You really did have to be there. So anyway, very exciting. It's very exciting for me. And uh, I will be seeing it on Monday night on the Paramount lot. Assuming I'm not, you know, banned for my opinions about modern Star Trek. I hope that I made a movie that has a scene where characters go to see Star Trek the motion picture. Maybe that, you know, I, I, I've already RSVP'd. I'm already on the list. Let's hope they don't kick me off that list. I hope not, because boy, do I love this movie. And I can't wait to see this version. Uh, the first time I was in the Paramount Theater on the Paramount lot was in 1994 to see Generations, and then, of course, I was hired. I was hired by CBS and Viacom to be a Star Trek consultant in the mid-'90s, which led to my job working on the Star Trek experience uh, for Landmark Entertainment, the $80 million Star Trek experience, and, of course, I later worked on Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Enterprise, the Blu-rays. So, very exciting. Um <laughs> I'm very excited about Star Trek motion picture. It is a joyous, joyous time. So I don't know what more I can tell you other than, wow, boy, oh boy, oh boy, I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Now let's see. You know, I have not been here in a while, so I'm a little rusty. So don't hold it against me. I hope, uh, I hope you'll bear with me here because... You know, what can I what can I say? Uh, you guys have been firing in a lot of super chats. So let's uh, let's see what you guys have to say. Uh, Mark Spector's avatar. Uh, are we getting Rob in 4K? I don't know if you're getting me in 4K. No, you're getting me in HD. But I'm here. Would you like to get me in 4K? Maybe soon. Maybe soon. Jeff Yerke, my man. Jeff Yerke, how are you? How are you, sir? And Mrs. Y, the most romantic couple. Claude and Candida and the Yerkes, man. We all got to get together and have a barbecue. Jeff Yerke says, Hi, Rob. Greetings and felicitations. We miss you so much since you moved to evenings. Well, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll come back during the day. 
Just a note to say, we love you and wish you guys well. Live long and prosper, the Yurk Man. Well, for longtime viewers of this channel, Elizabeth and I, when we're finished moving, we're bringing back whining about movies. And for those of oh, the flipperty gibbet, for those of you who don't know what whining about movies is, uh, Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell and myself are going to um, once again watch movies and talk about them as we share a bottle of wine. Uh, we do movie reviews. It's a lot of fun. We haven't done it in a while, so we'll come back. And you know, being working with John during the day, it's I I I will I'll be back on the weekends. I'm coming back. Uh, I've been gone too long, but I'll be back. I swear. Sheriff Carl, all the way from the PNW. Congratulations on all your recent successes in your new home. Always good to see hometown homies succeed. It's well-deserved, dude. Have you read Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's take on the Oscars smack? I did. For those of you who don't know, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, yes, that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is currently being uh, portrayed on screen in the HBO series Winning Time, The Rise of the L.A. Dynasty, L.A. Lakers Dynasty, which, by the way, is great. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I don't know how historically accurate it is, but it's a great, great show. Dig it a lot. Uh, I did read Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, by the way, is a TV writer. He wrote for the last Veronica Mars series, and he writes, I think his new, he has a, a column on Substack, and it's really, really good. He wrote a really good take on um, the Oscars, the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing. Look it up. Look at look for it. It's really, really good. Um, makes me wish we had a grown-up like him in charge of the world. Yeah, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a very smart guy. And uh, I really like his takes. He's been writing novels, Sherlock Holmes novels and things. An amazing talent. <clears throat> Alex K. sends in a tip and says, A while back, Rob came to my office sobbing because everyone else had Tilly. And he wanted his own Tilly. Someone he could see as himself on the show. And he got on his knees begging that I cast Paul Wesley as Captain Kirk because he looks like a young Rob. Yeah, because, you know, uh, of course... They have to have a new Captain Kirk on Strange New Worlds. It can't survive on its own. You know, I just, I don't understand. I mean, as showrunners, I would think, okay, you've already got Kirk, Spock, and number one, you got Pike, Spock, and number one. I don't see any mention of Dr. Piper, who is a great character, played by a great actor, by the way. Uh, I don't get why they wouldn't want to create a whole brand new set of characters, uh, They've got a, a descendant of Khan Noonie and Singh, which makes no sense. Uh, Spock never talked about this character on the Enterprise when they met Khan Noonie and Singh, the real one, and Uhura. And where are the original characters? Why does Star Trek have to fall back? There's no strange new worlds in Strange New Worlds. It's, it's, it's well, it's new worlds to us, but characters you've already met before. I don't get it. Don't understand. Where's the originality? Um, but Alex K, yeah, Captain Kirk, I mean, but that guy, I, 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 here's my problem, <laughs> people in movies nowadays and TV shows, they're all too good looking, they all look like models, they don't look like real people, I think one of the great things about the way that the original Star Trek series was cast is that everybody looked believable, you're like, I, those guys are real people, as opposed to supermodels. The, the guy they cast as Kirk, I mean, I, I understand he's a, he's a good actor and he's been on other shows, but what was he on, Vampire Diaries or something? But, I mean, look at him. <laughs> he's just, I don't believe him. He's sitting in the captain's chair. I'm like, is this guy, is this like a Abercrombie and Fitch ad that he's using Star Trek as a background? I don't know. Don't know. But, hey, maybe it'll be good. Hey, I go into every Star Trek, fingers crossed, maybe it will be good. Since 2009, it's been 13 years. Not nothing I've liked, not one thing. Uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe my next one, the next one will be better. Uh, man sends in a super chat and says, "My man Rob, always love it when I catch you." Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Man, it's good to be back. My man Tom Junior Jackson, we are all goof people. Says, "Is that Walter Cronkite?" My eyes are not so good. Oh, it's Rob. I welcome, welcome back, boss. Do I look like Walter Cronkite? Um, 
Uh, I guess I kind of do, I suppose. Alex K says, Rob, we gave Spoke a learning disability of Spock. We gave Spock a learning disability because we wanted to make sure you had representation on screen, which is something very important to modern Trek, and you're still not happy. Hopefully you'll be happy with New Kirk since we've cast Paul Wesley. Here's the thing. I never wanted to see myself on screen uh, when I was watching Star Trek. As a matter of fact, I didn't want to ever see myself on screen. I didn't need representation of me. I, 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 here, we live in a, in a, in a cosmic infinitude that will forever be beyond our understanding, which means there's a universe out there that's way greater than me. And I always believe that one of the reasons I watched Star Trek is that I like the fact that these were people that I, they were better than me. Star Trek's elitist. Star Trek says, you know what? We, we got to do better. <laughs> In order to get into that Star Trek future, we have to work harder. We have to be smarter. We have to be more enlightened, more evolved. We have to be better people. And I knew that. And I, I, I had no problem with that. You know, when Star Trek says boldly go where no one has gone before or no man has gone before, do that. Boldly go where you haven't gone before. Modern Star Trek is full of people that, uh, I already know. I'm looking. I don't. I don't. They're not aspirational to me. As a matter of fact, I don't like most of the characters on Star Trek now because all of them are relatively incompetent. And when they do achieve something, it's because they stumbled across it. Um, I want them all to die. To be honest, I hate them all. I hate all the characters on modern Star Trek because they're written as their pe as if they're people today. I do not believe that in the 32nd century, a thousand years from now. The characters that we've met in Star Trek Discovery, it is a fundamental failure of imagination to show us characters that even remotely resemble us today. Because we were very different kinds of people a thousand years ago. Can you imagine if you brought a human being from the 12th century or the 11th century uh, ahead in time to now? There's nobody on modern Star Trek I aspire to be. And I think that's a fundamental problem with the show. Everybody wants to see themselves represented. Why? Why? You need to be, if you want to see yourself represented on Star Trek, you need to be better. You need to get better. We all need to get better in order to be on Star Trek. But nowadays, yeah, everyone got to, you got to, uh, you've got to, you've got to, uh, um, uh, <laughs> no, I guess not. You know, we don't, we don't have to, we don't have to do anything. We, no one wants to do any work to, uh, anymore. Danny Chadwick. Sends in a super chat and says, I'm a journalist and I'm writing an article titled What to Watch Before Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Sure, well, Danny, I would say this. First of all, don't watch the fucking cage. I do not understand why the cage is the first time it was a failed pilot for Star Trek. It was rejected by the networks. But famously... They repurposed the cage into a two-part first season episode of the original series called The Menagerie, parts one and two. Don't watch the cage because the cage is not canonical, even though they keep going back to it. Captain Pike, they've now, I mean, it's who would have thought? Anyway, so what you got to do where you begin with Strange New Worlds is you must watch The Menagerie, parts one and two. Don't watch The Cage. Watch The Menagerie Parts 1 and 2 because you need to see them in context in the show. Now, in terms of Dr. Mbenga, who's another character uh, that they're using, that they have, uh, they, have, they have stolen for Strange New Worlds, um, I would say for him, if you want to know... Uh, uh, the the episodes, he, there's a couple of episodes that I would watch because Doctor Mbenga is in them. Uh, Jabilo Mbenga, blah 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 blah. blah. Um, anyway, uh, so what you want to do is you want to watch um, uh, a private little war, which is pretty interesting. That's got a that's got a good um, a good. Uh, uh, episode and um i mean that's a pretty good one 
And I, I, I think that, that that will show you uh, something that, that uh, you need to see with him. Let's see who else is in. Christine Chapel, you know, watch Amok Time. Amok Time's got a great Christine Chapel scene with him. Um, and uh, I think that's, I think that's uh, obviously great. And um, let's see who else is in the show. You know, number one, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, the Galileo seven, I think is, uh, another great episode. Um, and I think, uh, you should, uh, watch that too. Why not? Um, I'm saying let's, I'm looking up and I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to, to, um, Actually, you know what? The Galileo 7 is not... uh, Dr. Mbenga, I'm thinking um, 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 Mr. Boma. That is not the same guy. Um, That's Don Marshall. But but, uh, Private Little War is good because Dr. Mbenga does... He slaps Spock. It's good. So watch that. So that's a few, you know. Just just watch the 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 menagerie part one and two. That's the most important thing because everything that they're doing is based on uh, the cage. So, um, let's see, Lynn, our friend, Lynn Hobday. Lynn, how are you? Our favorite Brit expat in Japan. Rob, what great news. I have to rush to a meeting, but I had to listen to you live, even for just a little while, quietly crying with joy. Well, Lynn, I'm back. I'm glad you are crying with joy. Um, actually, Danny, you know what? You should watch the Galileo 7 anyway, even though Dr. Mbeng is not in it. It's Mr. Boma, and I was mistaken, because, you know, what can I tell you? Watch the Galileo 7 anyway, because it's one of the first episodes where Spock has to take command. And it's a really interesting episode between uh, him and McCoy. So watch that. It's also another fir- great first season episode. Watch that episode. Um, Smell the Sing says, that whole bad robot school of filmmaking seems to have consciously decided to make an enemy of original originality yeah i don't understand i i really don't understand it i don't understand uh why they do what they do it's it's very it's very depressing you know i don't i don't dig it uh don't dig it don't understand why michael preston says welcome back rob thank kirk uh you're back we all missed you i'm about to buy a prius prime how are you enjoying yours was it worth the price for you well michael i have to say I, I have a Prius Prime now, and I really like the Prius Prime. I think it's a great piece of technology. You know, I've got the uh, upgraded uh, audiovisual system. I don't have the self-parked stuff. I don't have that. I liked it. I mean, I did think it was a little expensive. I needed a car, a new car, though, so I, I liked it. I like it. I like it. I It's really comfortable, uh, and I now that I'm driving 120 miles a day, I'm um, I'm really enjoying it. You know, it's it's not maybe not as zippy as I want it to be, but again, it's it's a hybrid, it's a heavy car because you've got multiple batteries and an engine in it. But I enjoy it. I like the technology in it. I think it's good. Uh, Jordan Sailor Sailor sends in a super chat. And Star Trek: The Motion Picture needs to be seen on the big screen. It does, and I can't wait to see it on Monday night again. Justin Toner says, "Rob, I'm excited to see these new deleted scenes on the 4K Blu-ray for the Motion Picture Director's Edition." Could some be of the memory wall stuff they cut out? No, because they really never finished that. You know, there's photographs of it, but the memory wall sequence was never finished. So um, don't, uh, you know, it, 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 it just, it doesn't look good. Uh, it's interesting, but it doesn't look good. Michael Preston says, I also finally saw No Time to Die. Bond was a great disappointment, and he just stood there and waited to die. He didn't even try and jump in the water. Plus, he came in a submarine. You know, why didn't he go down and take off in his little water glider? It, it just didn't make any, I just, you know, it, it, yeah, not a fan. I was not a fan of that film. To be honest, I think the entire Daniel Craig run, I love Casino Royale. I'm an apologist for Quantum of Solace, but the other three movies are a complete disappointment to me. Um. Uh, Darth Plato says, if not Spock was cast with a learning disability, then what are they trying to do with Kirk? Give him a club club foot? Nah, that would make as much sense as putting a wheelchair guy in a starship. Oh, right. Yep. Uh, don't understand this. I mean, in the future, these kinds of ailments will be cured. 
you know, and and if you, you don't need to be in a wheelchair anymore, you'll have you'll be like Melora. See, they've already dealt with all of this stuff. They've already dealt with it in Star Trek. It's just the people that are making Star Trek don't know because they haven't watched all the episodes. So they haven't gone through and dealt with uh, all the different kinds of technology that they that they have. They have anti-gravity technology. So why would you use a wheelchair? You'd use anti-gravity lifts. That's what they would do. And um, I understand they're trying to appeal to the modern age, but it makes no sense. You know, science fiction, great science fiction is supposed to extrapolate on the universe that we live in right now so where are we going to be two or three hundred years from now where are we going to be a thousand years from now we'd be all transhuman you know we'd we'd have uh, we we would be half borg in the future we'd probably live hundreds of years longer than we do now but they don't do deal with any of that it's so it's so frustrating Ooh, electron star collapses here i was surprised that with all the modern shows and movies on streaming, I was still captivated by TNG. Why? The show didn't even have its beard yet. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about Star Trek The Next Generation is, or the original series, it's an anthology show. In 45 minutes, Next Generation, or in 52 minutes, like the original series, it sets up a premise, introduces you to it, and it takes you through a journey with a beginning, a middle, and an end. I mean, there is so much more going on in one episode of Star Trek, The Next Generation, or the original series, than in an episode of Picard. I mean, I swear to God, now that they're back on Earth in modern-day San Francisco or uh, Los Angeles, I feel that we're watching a network TV show from 1982. It is so uninspired and so disappointing. And since when, when can a spacecraft crash down into France... Even if it's in a in a chateau that's currently unoccupied, what you know, no air defenses in Europe today or in two years from now would see a ship crash on a vineyard in France. Apparently not. Come on. Anyway, don't know what to say about any of that. Anyway, just wanted to tell you all about Star Trek: The Motion Picture and how excited I am to see it. And uh, I got to get my sea legs back to do these shows. This is my first Raw Observations uh, since March 6th. I promise April will be full of me streaming on my own channel. I appreciate all the members. I appreciate my moderating staff. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Brian Hepburn's here. Justin Toner's here. Uh, Jordan Saylor sent, sent in just a super chat. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, that's very nice of you to do. Uh, very, very cool. So thank you very much appreciated um but but there's gonna be more observations and by the way some things that are happening we're finally finishing the film festival it's like two years late but for those of you who want to know go to the new website the post geek singularity.com you can send me letters you anything you want to say to me you can go to the post geek singularity.com send me letters and look, there's a playlist of all the semifinalists in the film festival. We are going to be finishing that, and we are going to be relaunching the short story competition. Now, for those of you who don't know, we uh, started out, but I just got busy with Tango Shalom, and things flew off the rails, but we're putting it all back. So we're going to give away awards for the film festival, including Beecher's Handmade Cheese is giving out a $200 cash prize for an award, which is very cool. Uh, for the Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival, but for the short story competition, um, you there there are rules, but it, it's, there's a twenty five dollar entry fee. But we are going to publish a hardcover book called The Imagination Connoisseurs, and the premise is: I want you to write a short story, a novella, whatever you want, and the overarching theme of the story is. What is an imagination connoisseur and what does it mean to be an imagination connoisseur? We're also running a, uh, a cover contest to design the cover. And then we are going to publish a hardcover book. Um, all the people that all the contributors will get copies of the book, but then we'll have the books for sale. And we're going to publish the first um, um, imagination connoisseurs unlimited book. That's what the company's called, uh, Imagination Connoisseurs Unlimited. We're going to be making films and content under that banner. And so we're going to be finishing off the film festival first and give out the awards. 
uh, and you can watch. There's a playlist. You can link to it. All the movies are on the YouTube channel currently. They've been there for the last couple of years, but you can watch the semi-finalists, and they're all listed on the postgeeksingularity.com website, and you can go there, and you can also send me letters, which I'm going to get back and start reading. And I will be back here tomorrow, uh, hopefully with another show that uh, in the afternoon that is less uh, d- discombobulated the way I am. I want to get back on. I wasn't quite ready to go. <laughs> but hey, here I am. Star Trek The Motion Picture coming to you, the director's edition, the definitive 4K Dolby Atmos HDR version of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Is coming to Paramount Plus on Tuesday. Very exciting. Hope to see you. Uh, I want to hear comments. I want to hear what you think. If you've never seen Star Trek The Motion Picture before, this is the way to see it. It's going to be the definitive version of the movie, despite the nitpicks I might have. Uh, hopefully, you'll uh, you'll enjoy it as much as I do. And that brings me an end. Brings me brings me to an end. I'm, ex- I'm exhausted. <laughs> we had a long day. Uh, you can watch the movie club for Man of Steel, which we did today. And, of course, the John Campy show. Uh, you can see me on there every day at 10 a.m. I'm going to watch Moon Knight. I can't believe it. In an hour and 40 minutes. I'm going to walk the dogs, throw in some laundry, and watch Moon Knight. And on that note, I want to thank everybody who supports this channel via Super Chats and Tips. And those of you who become members of the channel... We have member calls every other week, which are fun. You can watch the videos. They usually last two or three or four hours for all members. We just chat and shoot the shit, and uh, you can watch those because we're doing those now live on the channel for those of you who become members of the channel, so thank you for that, and thank everyone who does support the channel with Super Chats and Tips. I very much appreciate that. It keeps us going. It's going to help me make some serious improvements um, to the new Rob Observatory. A lot of, lot of lights, a lot of things, and um, it's going to be good. So on that note, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, live long and prosper. Or as the Klingons might say, survive and succeed. <laughs>